Giving an Ass is a show dedicated to defending the historic Christian faith. I am your host, Harold Felder, and today the topic is biblical interpretation. And I have an expert guest with me today to talk about this topic, and his name is Dr. Tom Howe. Let me give you a little bit of background on Dr. Tom Howe. He has a PhD in philosophy, from a, a PhD in philosophy of religion. He is professor of biblical of the Bible and biblical languages at Southern Evangelical Seminary. He teaches a bunch of different languages. Some of the languages that he teaches: Greek, Hebrew, Latin, Aramaic, and Syriac. He also teaches Old Testament survey, logic, philosophy, just a whole bunch of stuff. He's also director of apologetics of the apologetics program at Southern Evangelical Seminary, and he's the author of a number of journals, articles and journals, and mm -hmm. a book, When Critics Ask. That's right. And Objectivity in Biblical Interpretation. That's right. So, and you also have your own website. What's all, okay, what is your What's website? What's all this then? <laughs> What's what all this then? What is that about? What is that? Well, that's actually a phrase from uh, Monty Python. Uh, at the end of every skit, they would be, uh, and they didn't know how to end the skits. Uh -huh. And uh, so they would have a guy come from Scotland Yard and he would just come in and say, what's all this then? So, okay. uh, you know, Monty Pythoners, they all know that. So, okay, uh, okay, okay. <laughs> now here's an interesting fact that people don't know that this show started as a project for Dr. Howell because I was in his class. That's I was right. a student of Dr. Dr. Howell when I was in seminary before I graduated. And Did you graduate? Yeah, oh, okay. I think you actually <laughs> may have signed that. But I, I guess I snuck through the cracks. There. Yeah, that's right. But actually, yes, it started out as a, as a field experience. Yes. And it became right. now a regular TV show, yes. yeah. radio show, uh, national radio show now, 501-3C, wow, nonprofit. Know that. I have a board of directors. I go wow. around speaking all from this project that I had in your class. That's right, but you did it. But I did it. I had nothing to do with that. But you graded me on it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you had to actually watch yeah. some of them, so. Yeah, yeah well, okay. that's true. So let's get to it. Dr. Howe, what is biblical interpretation? Well, interpretation is something that uh, we all do. We interpret um, people's uh, expressions. Well, you know, what are they thinking when they say that? What do they really mean? We interpret their tone of voice. Uh, we interpret the things that we read, um, and uh, basically what we're trying to do is we're trying to find out what does this person mean by what they're saying. Sometimes people may mean something a little bit more than uh, what they actually say, so we have to interpret, we have to try to understand, uh, figure out what it is that they are saying. But when it comes to uh, ancient documents, we have other factors that we have to understand the languages, understand the history, understand the historical circumstances. So interpretation is just an effort to try to come to an understanding of meaning. What does the text mean? So then, this is, that's why I love to do this, this show. I mean, it's a very important topic for Christians. Oh, yeah. But, okay, so how then? When I come to the scriptures, how do I determine what a passage means? Well, there's a lot of different things. A lot of passages are uh, very easy to understand. You just read them uh, just like communication. You know, when somebody says something, most of the time you understand what they mean. When the Bible says, do not boil a kid in its mother's milk, well, it's pretty straightforward. You're just not supposed to do that. Don't, right. don't get a baby a goat and boil it in its mother's milk. So that doesn't involve a whole lot of interpretation because the, the language is pretty straightforward. But there are passages that are difficult to understand for a lot of different reasons. We don't understand the, the terms involved. Uh, we don't understand the cultural background. Uh, for example, when um, the uh, people coming uh, into the plains of Shinar in Genesis, uh, they build a uh, tower, and we know that as the Tower of Babel. Uh, why in the world do they build a tower? We don't understand the meaning or the significance of this act. Uh, why are they doing this? Well, yeah. in this ancient culture, it was generally believed that your God dwelt in a mountain, and the mountain was significant of God up there and you down here. You're separated from God. He is high and lifted up. But when you come into the plains of Shinar, there's no mountains. <laughs> Okay. So they have to build one, and they build a mountain in which their God can dwell. So we need that historical background information in order to make sense out of what they are talking about, what they're doing. Uh, so this kind of information sometimes is uh, not available to someone, and uh, we have to go and dig that out. So there are a lot of factors involved in understanding a passage. Some are easy, some are more difficult. Okay, okay. So 
what role does the Holy Spirit play when we're trying to understand the meaning of a passage? Well, personally, um, I don't know of a passage in the Bible that indicates that the Holy Spirit has anything to do with our understanding the meaning of the Bible. Um, Jesus said that the Holy Spirit would uh, come and speak to us of Him. He told us that uh, His primary ministry is to convince the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Um, a lot of people refer to the passage in John where uh, Jesus said He will guide you into all truth. Right, that's what I was thinking of. Yeah, well the problem with that is it doesn't say He will guide you into all truth. Uh, with the word into, it sounds like, you know, I'm going to lead you so that you can understand truth. The text actually says, He will guide you in the truth. So it's more like, it's more like He's guiding you as you learn the truth, okay? He's guiding you in that truth. What He does is, the Holy Spirit makes you realize, makes you understand that this truth applies to you. That's the, he's supposed to convince of sin, righteousness, and judgment. So he makes the, uh, the text apply to me. He makes me see that that applies to me. Most people can understand. Uh, I've seen uh, unbelievers who can understand uh, the scripture. Uh, I had a professor once who went, um, took a class at Harvard. And um, the professor was teaching on the book of Romans. And uh, he went through and explained the message of the book of Romans. And uh, my professor said, I'd never heard such a good presentation of the gospel in my life. It was great. In fact, when he got through, the, all the people in the class were sitting, you know, just astounded. <laughs> okay. And then one of the students lifted up the hand and said, yeah, but do you believe it? And the professor said, no, I don't believe it's true. Mm. So unbelievers can come to the Bible and understand the Bible, but it's very unlikely that the Holy Spirit is teaching them. Uh, so the idea here is that it's, it's not the responsibility of the Holy Spirit to, to give us the meaning of the Scripture. Uh, that's the responsibility of us to go in and dig it out. Uh, and and uh, why, I know the next question is, yeah. why is it so hard then? Why is it so yeah. difficult? Yeah. Why do we get so many uh, uh, different interpretations? Yeah, well, I mean, you, you get your sort of you were sort of leading up to it, but, yeah. but you sort of, I mean, I, I actually didn't expect that answer. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Most because, people don't. Because I was expecting you to say, well, you know, this and that, because yeah. th that's what we always hear. That's, that's what I've exactly always right. heard, yeah. is that the Holy Spirit, you know, leads us in the truth. And yeah. so I was going to then use that as a platform to my next question. Well, if the Holy Spirit is leading everyone into truth of right. the Scriptures, then why are there so many interpretations of Scripture? That's right. If the Holy Spirit is, is teaching us the Scripture, then uh, we have a real problem with um, why is everybody getting different interpretations. Is the Holy Spirit not doing His job? Right. Uh, and then also we have a problem of, well, how do we verify that the meaning that I'm getting from the text is from the Holy Spirit or not? Well, now most right, people right, say, right, right. you know, most people just say, well, uh, we verify it by going back to the Bible and studying the Bible and seeing that the meaning is, is uh, with or right with the Bible. But if that's true, then let's just go to the Bible. You yeah. know, if we have to, if you have to verify everything by coming to the Bible anyway, well, let's just stay there. So, um, the uh, ministry of the Holy Spirit, the illumination of the Holy Spirit, is not illuminating the meaning. Uh, we we can get the meaning just by going and understanding. That's part of the uh, the uh, image of God in us, the capacity to reason, to think, to communicate. It's it's not accidental that the creation of the universe is expressed in terms of God speaking and God said. Because the capacity for uh, communication, linguistic communication, mm -hmm. that is the mark of the image of God in man. That's what distinguishes man from the animals. The capacity for self-consciousness, and that self-consciousness is tied into the capacity to be able to speak to myself, right. to talk to myself. I can uh, think through, I can uh, reason in my own mind and reason with others. That's an uh, aspect of the image of God. So our being able to communicate in words is imitating God who creates by His Word. So God has given us the capacity to reason, to think, and to communicate linguistically. And uh, 
he uses that or capitalizes on that capacity uh, in the, the written communication. And we can go there and we can read and understand. And it's not the ministry of the Holy Spirit to uh, help us find that meaning or understand that meaning. Uh, it's, and it's difficult. Uh, one of the reasons there are so many interpretations yeah. is because some people uh, do the work, others don't. Some people do their homework and others don't. It's, uh, it's a difficult thing to, to come in and try to study the Bible. It requires time and effort, you know. The Old Testament was written in uh, Hebrew. How many people really want to learn Hebrew? Well, Dr. Geisner, I mean, Dr. Geisner, Dr. Dr. Thank Howell. you, I appreciate that. <laughs> I'm taking There'll your be class, an extra $5 you know. for you. <laughs> I'm taking your class, and that's, Hebrew is not an easy language to learn. I right? heard that, yeah, it's not. It's not for anybody. Well, for some people it is, but it's difficult. And it requires, um, it requires time and effort. A lot but of time. yeah, uh, we don't want to take the time, and we don't want to expend the effort. So a lot of people just don't do their homework. And consequently, they get, um, wrong meaning. Um, for example, let me give you a good example out of Genesis. I love this example. This is great. This is Genesis chapter 2. Um, now this is something uh, just about every translation says this. It says, then the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and to keep it. All right. Now one of the things you have to, one of the things you have to know about communication is uh, language. How does language work? What is a, uh, for example, what is a pronoun? What does a pronoun do? Well, we know these things uh, intuitively. We don't have to think about it uh, because it's part of our language. Uh, we communicate and we don't even think about it. We right. understand exactly what people are saying. Right. Well, when it comes to interpreting a text, right. and particularly a text that's in a different language, we need to know something about that language. Now, in English, it says, the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden to cultivate it and to keep it. Well, what are they cultivating and keeping? Sounds like the garden, doesn't it? Yeah, that's what it? I yeah. would think. Yeah. Except the problem here is that the its are masculine, excuse me, the, the its are feminine in the Hebrew text, and the word garden is masculine. Now, in grammar, if a pronoun is referring to a noun, they have to agree in gender. Okay. So since the pronoun it here is feminine, and the word garden is masculine, they can't be keeping the garden. Well, then what are they then keeping? Are they keeping? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, and in fact, uh, some people say, well, it refers to the word Eden. No, because the word Eden is also masculine. So uh, what in the world are they keeping and cultivating then? Well, in the Hebrew language, these pronouns are actually added to the end of a word. And uh, when they're added to the end of a verb, they can actually change the function of a verb from a, a verb, like, say, to an infinitive, okay? Instead of saying they are keeping, it would be to keep. In fact, these two words are used throughout the Pentateuch and are translated uh, to worship and obey. So the text, what it says here is, then the Lord God took the man and caused him to rest in the garden to worship and obey. That's a lot different than That's a lot. Yeah, it's a lot different. As a matter of fact, when does man begin to work the ground? Not till after the fall. And verse 15 says, and the Lord God took the man and uh, your translation probably says put him in the garden. Mm -hmm. The word here is um, nuach. Which, from which we get the name Noah, which means rest. So when God took the man, he put him in the garden to rest, not to work. You don't put the man in the garden to rest and then tell him, oh, you gotta, you gotta cultivate the garden, by the way. No, this, the garden is a place of rest. That's where you yeah. rest in the good things that God has given you. And this is why when they're driven out of the garden, they have to work. Hmm. You know, they have to work to sustain their lives. No, in the garden, God sustains your life. You don't work to sustain your own life. You don't work to get good things from God. God gives them by His grace. Wow. So, um, it requires an understanding of language, understanding of words, how they work, how sentences work, how words relate to one another. Yeah. And besides that, it's not just English. 
I mean, we got to be able to understand, well, what does the uh, original language say? But that's difficult to do. It's difficult to learn another language. Now here's, here's, someone may be thinking to themselves, well, if that's the case, then how can I even go to my Bible? Why even pick it up? Because I don't know Hebrew. I don't know Greek. So how can I understand what it means then? Well, somebody has to understand it. And we need to be able to trust the individuals who are up there teaching us that they can do understand it and are presenting it accurately. But with the computer software, with uh, the reference materials out there, an individual can learn to look at the Hebrew words and understand what they're saying without ever trying to actually master the language. There's a whole lot you can do just by using uh, computer programs or reference materials because it's all designed to help uh, the person who's the non-Hebrew reader or the non-Greek reader for the New Testament to be able to get into the original language and, and know something and to learn something uh, about the original language in order to learn more about God. There's a lot of good material out there. You're right though, it does, <laughs> it does take people, it does take uh, effort, yeah. it does take time and that's exactly the problem because people just don't want to take the time. Hey, I could learn the language. If I can learn it, anybody can learn it. It just requires effort, but you yeah. want to put forth the effort is a problem. Now, here's a, here's a question. What would you say to someone who says, well, does the scripture really have a meaning in and of itself? I mean, why can't, when I go to the scriptures, why can't what the scripture mean be what it means to me. If I'm reading a passage and something jumps out at me, why couldn't, why, why is it that what it actually means? Well, um, I don't know if I, I, I think I understand what you mean jump out at you. Usually what people are saying there is that it becomes significant in some way for me. But the significance of a passage, the, uh, the fact that it affects me in some way, it encourages me in some way, all this is uh, predicated on the fact that we understand, first of all, what does it mean? I, I wouldn't get, I wouldn't, it wouldn't jump out at me if I didn't know what it meant. And uh, I can say the same thing with the question. Why, why can't your question, you just asked me, why, why doesn't it mean just what I want it to mean? Well, why, why don't I just take your sentence and make it mean what I want it to mean? <laughs> When you tell, when you ask me, you expect me to know what you mean. Well, we couldn't communicate if you that's started right. doing that. That's right. <laughs> and so it's the same with the uh, Bible. It has a meaning that's in the text and that God expects us and has uh, equipped us to be able to get. And uh, the meaning is there. We just have to go in and, uh, and sometimes we have to dig it out. Sometimes it's difficult. I mean, look at Proverbs. Proverbs is really interesting the way it begins. Um, it talks about the uh, wise gaining wisdom. In fact, Proverbs is supposed to be written in order for you to gain wisdom. It says in verse 2, to know wisdom and instruction, to discern sayings of understanding, to receive instruction and in wise behavior, righteousness, justice, equity, to give prudence to the naive. Okay, so he wants to be able to teach people who are naive how they can live in a way that's smart. Okay, the word prudence there is the same word that is used in Genesis to refer to the serpent. The serpent was more cunning than all this. Same word. Uh, prudence. Remember what Jesus said about that. He said, be as prudent as a serpent, but as gentle as a dove. Mm. So we need to be cunning in the way we live. We need to be smart. Smart about the things we have. Smart about the things we're supposed to do. So we're supposed to be able to come to Proverbs and get that, you know, because we're naive. Well, we're supposed to get prudence. To the youth, the young people, he wants to give knowledge and discretion. A wise man will hear and increase in knowledge. Well, you already got to be a wise man in order to hear? I thought you were coming to the book to be wise. Right. And then it says, a man of understanding will acquire uh, wise counsel. Well, you already got to be a man of understanding in order to get wise counsel. I thought I was going to become a man of understanding by getting their wise counsel. To understand a proverb and an enigma. Well, why do these guys write in enigmas? Why don't they just come out and say it? The words of the wise and their riddles. Now, why do they speak in riddles? Right. Um, chapter 26. Here's a very good example of the riddle. Uh, verses 4 and 5. Do not answer a fool according to his folly, or you will also be like him. Answer a fool 
as his folly deserves, that he may not be wise in his own eyes. Well, when am I supposed to answer and when am I not? Yeah. That's what it means to be wise. A wise man knows when. Well, how do you get there? Well, you get there through the struggle. The struggle, struggling with God's Word. Yeah. Getting in there and digging it out for yourself. I mean, somebody just came along and just told you, oh, this, this is what it all means. Well, you might get it, you might not. You might remember some, you might not. Right. But if you get in there and dig it out yourself, that process changes you yeah. on the inside, and that sticks with you. And so the wise man knows that part of instruction is the struggle with the knowledge, the struggle with the wisdom, going through the experience of learning. I mean, when you first started this project here, you probably did some things right and some things not so right. Oh, yeah. But from experience, from doing, from not doing so well, learning to do better, you begin to be able to develop a quality product. But there were some things they told you in the classes, right. but they gave you some basic principles. But the one thing they couldn't tell you in the class, the one thing they can't just tell you from a book, is the experience you need to have in order to be able to produce that good product. You have to do that through experience. That's what the wise man, and that's why sometimes the Bible is difficult. Yeah. Because God's saying, you need to come in here and you need to struggle with me because it's that struggle with us together, our struggling together with the Word. So you're not going to be able to tell me, me. You're not going to be able to tell me five simple principles no, uh, to biblical no, interpretation. No, you're saying no. that it's a process. It's a struggle. It's, yes, it's, it is, and it's a long. It's a lifelong process. Well, this that could explain why there's so much biblical literacy. Yes, yes. Not only are the individuals um, uh, in the pew um, unwilling to spend the time usually, but the individual in the pew has got his own life to live. He's got his own things that God wants him to do. Uh, God doesn't necessarily want everybody in the pew to be a Hebrew scholar. Uh, he has people for that purpose. Um, in the church, it should be the pastor. Now, how many pastors going through seminary take a Hebrew classes and then forget it? You know, never deal with it again. Why? Well, it's too difficult. It's too hard. So when pastors get up to preach a lot of times, uh, all they've had to deal with is the English text. And, well, we've already seen that sometimes that's not quite good enough. We need to get back to the original language. But it's difficult. It's hard. Wow. Well, here's another question. What's all the relationship right. between the purpose and meaning and interpretation? Well, if you mean by purpose, do you mean why somebody writes right, something? Right, yeah. right. We know why John, I mean, John wrote a book or Paul wrote a book. Can we then use that to interpret it? Yeah, but uh, we think we know why. And I'm glad you mentioned John. Okay. All right, because everybody points to John. Oh, I as, forgot. John's yeah. your favorite book. <laughs> I forgot about that. <laughs> um, in fact, there's a statement in John that's, that's usually taken uh, to be um, the uh, purpose statement of the Gospel of John. Uh, and many other things truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, but these are written in verse 30 and 31. Many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, but these are written in order that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and believing you might have life in his name. Well, that sounds like the purpose of the book, doesn't it? Yes. Except for a couple of things, he says, first of all, many other signs. Well, other than what? Well, people say, well, other than the rest of the ones in the book. Right. Well, that's circular reasoning. You can't assume that it's the others in the book in order to prove that it's the others in the book. Hmm. Usually the others is part of the context. And in fact, the other could be a reference to the immediately previous sign which Jesus performed for Thomas which was a post-resurrection sign. Many other signs Jesus did after the resurrection. And notice what also it says. It says he performed in the presence of his disciples, not in the general public, like the uh, signs that he performed in, verse, in chapters 1 through 12. That was out in the public. Here, this is for the disciples. This is talking about post-resurrection signs to prove to the disciples that he had raised from the dead. This isn't a purpose statement about the book. This is a purpose statement about the post-resurrection signs. So even when we think we know what the purpose of the book is, we may not know what the purpose of the book is. But even if we don't know why John wrote it, 
we know what he said. Um, do not boil a kid in his mother's milk. Now, why did God tell Moses to tell the children of Israel not to do that? Nobody knows. There's a lot of speculation. Well, it's because the pagans did that. Well, we don't really know if any of the pagans did that. Well, it's because it's, it looks bad in the relationship between uh, mother and daughter or mother and child. Well, it doesn't really say that either. Uh, we don't know why he said that. But even if we don't know why he said it, we still know what it means. It means don't do it. Right. So we don't have to know the purpose. That is to say, we don't have to know why somebody wrote something to know what they said. In fact, sometimes the... Uh, what we think to be the purpose of the book has been used by critical scholars to call the historicity of the book in question. In uh, Genesis chapter 1, it's a creation account. Well, a critical scholar will say, well, God's, God's purpose is not to give us a scientific explanation of creation, and therefore it's all right if it has some uh, uh, scientific errors in it, because that wasn't God's purpose. You go, no, uh, we can't use uh, supposed purpose. First of all, we don't know that it wasn't scientific. Maybe it was. Where does it say it wasn't scientific? God never said it wasn't scientific. God never said that wasn't his purpose. So even if we don't know what his purpose is, we know what it says. Well, Dr. Howe, you're not going to believe this, but we've come to the end of the show. But we haven't We're covered, on a show? <laughs> but we haven't covered nearly what we were supposed to cover. Cover. So could you come back and I'd be uh, glad complete to. this show? Thank you. All right, thanks a lot. Dr. Howe, talking to me on biblical interpretation. That will end this episode of Giving an Answer. Be sure to join me again next time. And until then, goodbye and God bless.